Hello everybody and welcome to another lecture. We are covering the phylum Mollusca today. So I don't want to freak you out, but so far we've covered very, very small phylums. This is a very large phylum, so there is going to be a lot of taxonomy here. Um, don't get stressed out, I will let you guys know which taxonomy you're actually responsible for and how far we're actually going down. Um, so keep that in mind as we go through this lecture today. Here's where it kind of starts getting hard. So, I mean, it's, anyway, let's just get started. Let's just get started. Okay, so we are on the phylum Mollusca. Here is the start of the taxonomy list, and you're like, what do you mean the start of? So basically, I think I simplified this down as best I could. Um, now, we're really going to be focusing on classes here. So we'll remember the domain is the same, the kingdom is the same, the phylum is Mollusca, and now we're going to be going into a bunch of different classes, like the class Bivalvia, the class Gastropoda. Um, we have a bunch of other classes on the other page as well, but really we're going to be focusing mostly on class. Now, extra credit wise, maybe trick question wise, I could give you guys some of these other ones, but it would have to be something that we really spent time on. Maybe an example that I specifically spoke about for a while, or I had you guys watch a video on, hint, hint. Um, so again, this is kind of where I'm going to focus your guys' attention, not on all of this crazy taxonomy because I had to learn this, I teach this, but I'm not going to give you guys all of this, especially because I can't show you all of this in person. So it'd be different if I could show you in person, but today we're going to simplify just a little bit. And lucky you, because this stuff is kind of hard. Um, all right, so let's get the continuation list. So remember, we have the class Bivalvia, we have the class Gastropoda, we also have the class Aplacophora, Monoplacophora, Polyplacophora. I know, but those are all pretty simple. And last but not least, Cephalopoda, um, which I think is just the coolest class. So trust me, you're going to really, you're going to remember Cephalopoda. And a lot of these like Monoplacophora, Polyplacophora, we're going to give you characteristics that's going to make separating these guys out really simple. So just make sure that you guys are paying attention to that as we go along. Um, all right. So the phylum Mollusca characters, let's get into the characteristics. Now, their name Mollusca means soft bodies. So you really have to think of Mollusca and soft bodies kind of one and the same. And we're going to learn about some other names like Echinodermata, the spiny skinned organisms, right? So as soon as you see the soft body organisms, not gelatinous, but soft body, kind of like the squishies of our tissues, then you know, okay, for sure this must be a Mollusca. And really there are some pretty key telling distinguishing characteristics, um, just besides them being soft bodied. They are bilateral in symmetry, most of them. Um, they do have an open circulatory system. So remember when we talked about the closed circulatory system, like us, we have veins and arteries and blood flowing through the veins and arteries and that's circulating in our bodies, right? These guys, these guys do not have it. They have what's called an open circulatory sy system, meaning they don't have veins and arteries. If essentially their circulating fluid is just kind of bathing their whole body. Um, usually known as hemocyl, they're not blood, so very different circulating fluid. It's not going to be that red color, which is why if you open up like, you know, a clam, it doesn't squirt red blood at you because it doesn't have red blood. It doesn't have the hemoglobin. Okay, so it actually is hemocyl. So again, very different like structurally wise and also functionality wise. These guys just do simple diffusion, right? They're doing simple diffusion to do that circulating, unlike having their actual circulating fluid like us being delivered in veins and arteries to, you know, all of our bodies. These guys are just kind of bathed in that open circulatory system. Uh, they do have a muscular foot. So this is part of their soft body. They have a muscular foot. So essentially, this is kind of how they get along. So if you think of a clam, right, they're kind of closed up in that little shell. And if you've ever seen, they have like a little tongue that kind of comes out, kind of goes like this and kind of like pushes them into the, that's the foot, okay, the foot. Because they don't have an actual foot, they're not walking on it, but they're kind of moving with it. So we do call it a foot. Um, let's see, they have torsion. Oh, we're going to get to torsion. This is specifically for gastropoda, the class gastropoda. Torsion is a twisting of the shell or a twisting of really the visceral mass. Essentially, their digestive stuff, their reproductive organs, their circulating, that's everything. Um, you know, like basically the meaty good part of you, that would be the, um, the um, visceral mass or it's all their visceral organs. Um, they do have a mantle. Okay, so a mantle, again, is going to be this fleshy part of their body that actually secretes the shell. You know, this is going to be kind of important because we're going to talk about other shelled organisms that aren't really shells because they're not secreted by a shell gland. OK, 
Okay, so these guys actually have the mantle. The mantle has the shell gland. The shell gland secretes that shell material. So if you look at a clam, the clam didn't find that shell somewhere else. It made it with its mantle and its shell gland. Keep that in mind. Okay, um, they also have their shell, speaking of shells, is made of calcium carbonate. Remember, we have lots of different hard materials like silica and stuff like that. This is calcium carbonate shells. Uh, and they do, oh, this is so cool. They have what's called a radula. And a radula is like a rasping tongue. So to rasp kind of means like to, to really, to like to lick, to kind of. So essentially what they do, a lot of these guys, when they have these really hard radulas, is they, they kind of like crawl along licking rocks. And you're like, how can that be good for you? Well, if you have a tongue that looks like this, essentially what they're doing is they're scraping macro al or sorry, microalgae off the rocks. So if you've ever been down to the beach and you stepped on a rock and it's kind of slippery even though there's no water, that's microalgae. So a lot of these guys will actually crawl around the inner tidal just licking the rocks to get their food, which is just crazy, but also pretty cool. Okay, um, what else? Ah. Uh, Let's, let's just dive into this. Let's get, let's get to the nitty gritty and the examples and learn about each one of these. Cause you're like, we have to learn all these classes. Let's get down to it. So we learned all about the Molesca characteristics. So all of these different groups that we're going to talk about, all these different classes and subclasses and orders and all that are going to have these characteristics. Now, some of them are modified. Okay. Sometimes you don't have a radula that looks like this. Sometimes you have a radula that kind of looks like this. Kind of looks like a bird beak, right? We're going to learn who has those in just a second. Now, let's take a look at the first class. This is the class by Valvia. These are going to be your clams and your mussels and pretty much anything with two shells connected with a valve. Hence, bivalvia, right? Okay, bivalvia. These are pretty simple and pretty easy to identify. They're also pretty simple, right? They don't have a big fancy brain. They don't have eyes. They don't have a mouth per se. Um... But they do come in a variety of different shapes and sizes, and they're really good at what they do. Usually found buried in some kind of soft sediment, sometimes attached to, you know, either each other or other floating things, like in the case of mussels. Um, but these guys are filter feeders. They're really, really good at it. We're going to see that in just a, just a second. But this is all essentially one half of everyone's shell. So if you have the other shell on the other half, that makes it the bivalve connected with a, that hinge. Now, if we were actually to take a look inside, let me see if I can fix this. Okay. Uh, if we're actually to take a look inside, what we see, the first thing we notice right off the bat is this big part right here. And this big part right here is known as the mantle. Okay, that's, yes, the thing that secretes the shell. That's correct. But it's also kind of like what contains everything. Okay, this big bad boy right here, this is known as an adductor muscle. Okay, and it helps to clay that clam shut. Remember, if you are that shelled organism and you have two shells, you do need to keep them closed. Otherwise, predators are going to be able to get in there. So again, to avoid predation, we need nice, big, healthy adductor muscles that are going to keep that closed. Fun fact, a lot of times when you go to a seafood place, it may be not be the top of the line seafood place and you order scallops. A lot of the times you're just getting these puppies right here because they are so closely related. Really, they kind of are like scallops, clams, same thing, but nope. That is an adductor muscle and a scallop is a scallop. Don't let, any, don't let anyone tell you any different or serve you any different, I suppose. All right. Now let's talk about how they feed. We talked that they are um, filter feeders, right? So they are going to actually have to filter food from the water. So they're going to suck the water in. They're going to take those particles out of the water and then they're going to release the water. So we have our in-current flow, our in-current siphon and our out-current flow, our out-current siphon. Okay, siphon just means kind of just like a little sucking like tube almost. Okay, so we're going to siphon the water in. It's going to go over our gills right here. These gills are going to help not only pull out oxygen from the water, but it's also going to help filter that food. Okay, so the food is all going to kind of settle down here. We're going to get the food particles actually moved towards the mouth. Yes, they do technically have a mouth, but it's definitely not the one you're thinking of. It's way over here near their labial palps right here kind of tucked in here. And again, that's going to lead directly towards the stomach and simple diffusion is going to happen and the nutrients are going to bathe the whole system. Now, any kind of sand or dirt or material that doesn't have organics in it, including water, is going to get released out that X current flow. And yes, they are kind of right next to each other, but there are two little siphons. Um, what we can see right here. So again, we're going to release that sand and debris. We're going to release the water out. 
we have the shell on the outside. We have the two labial palps hanging down. Always tell. It looks like literally two little labial palps. Um, we've got the mantle here and here again. It's going to surround this whole thing. Imagine we cut this mantle off, peeled it away, and that's what we're looking at under there. So if we were to get to do a dissection, what you would have seen first is the mantle covering everything, and you have to cut into the mantle to get to everything. And this would all be considered like visceral mass, like everything in here is just your mass and your organs and pretty much everything that's in there. Oh, this guy is super cool. This is Sacoglossa. Um, Sacoglossa is an order. Okay, so this is under, let's go back for a second. I want to show you this. Okay, so under the class Bivalvia, we have the subclass Lemillibranchia. Lemillibranchia. Super fun to say, guys. You do not need to worry about these. I might make it an extra credit question or something, but you don't need to know about them. So the subclass is Lemillibranchia. The super order is Filibranchia. Um, and those are going to be your true oysters and your muscles. So this is exactly where they would fall under taxonomy wise. Now, this is a super order. Okay, if we were to actually go to the order Sacoglossa, these are your sea slugs. And in fact, this particular sea slug that we're looking at right here is kind of unique because not all sea slugs can do this, but this guy can. Essentially, what all this really pretty green in him is, is chloroplast. Chloroplast absorbed from algae and other plants that he ate. So essentially, he's going around eating this algae, taking their chloroplast, keeping the chloroplast inside of his cells instead of breaking them down and digesting them. And then if, if need be, if he's absolutely starving for food, he can actually trigger those little chloroplasts to start doing photosynthesis and produce his own sugars. We have a photosynthetic animal here, people. So remember, I said there's absolutely no animals on the entire planet that can do photosynthesis. This is the asterisk. Okay, super cool. Sacoglossa. Might be an extra credit question. I don't know, right? But sacoglossas are super cool because they are sea slugs, and some sea slugs can absorb chloroplasts into their system and therefore do photosynthesis. Now, it's not super effective, right? There's a reason that plants aren't walking around, right? So he does need to find his outside nutrients, but if conditions are really bad, he does have the backup. And again, this isn't like a fl fl flipping the switch when I say trigger. It's not like, turn on, I'm now doing photosynthesis. But you know what I mean. He can, he can again, do photosynthesis if he absolutely needs to. So there is one animal. So never say never. Sometimes. This guy can actually do photosynthesis. Ano another order, which is absolutely one of my favorites. This is Anaspidia. This is the sea hare. So we have off our coast the California sea hare, and if I had a chance to take you guys to an aquarium, you would absolutely be able to touch these guys because these are super cute and so soft. Kind of slimy, but so soft. Like when you pet them, you're like, and again, this is kind of alluding to their name of sea hare because when you pet them, you're like, oh my gosh, you're so soft and almost fluffy like a bunny. And that's because they kind of look like bunnies. Um, they also kind of reproduce like bunnies because fun fact, these guys are simultaneous hermaphrodites, meaning they have boy parts and girl parts at the same time. But because they have boy parts and girl parts at the same time, sometimes they get into these big groups and start fertilizing each other in all sorts of different ways, if you catch my drift. So these guys do form what's called orgies. I'm sure you've heard of that term. Or sex rings, where they get together in a line, right? So you'll either have like sea hair, sea hair, sea hair, all in a line, like. This one's fertilizing this one while this one's fertilizing this one while he's being fertilized by her, but she's being fertilized by him, but they're all the same. It's crazy. Or they form these like rings where again, it's very mutual and they all just get together and form this little sex ring. Yep. Sea hairs have sex rings and orgies. Guys, you never thought marine biology was going to be this fun talking about sex rings. Yep. But we do. That's what we do in marine biology. I know. Um, let's see. They do have very interesting habits, like our little professor here is teaching us. Um, they rest a lot of the times. So they just kind of sit there, but when not, you know, they're usually eating and pooping and mating and sometimes they're doing all three at the same time. Yeah. In a sex ring, um, which is absolutely crazy. Um, and we did talk about the chains that they can form or rings that they can form. And here's what they look like. So look at this cute little guy. He's got his little two little ears. They're not ears. He's got his little nose. It's not a nose. He's got a big old butt. It's not his butt. It's kind of his butt. 
right? And it's just kind of looks like you just want to pet him. Like, I just want to pet the little bunny. And you can because they're, like I said, super soft and squishy. And you just kind of pet them and you're like, oh, this is so soft. Um, sometimes they don't like that, though. And sometimes they reject your petting and say, get out of here. Like a lot of these mollusca, they have a defense. Sometimes chemical, sometimes gross. So this guy is actually inking right now, and so that's what he's doing. He's releasing this ink, and this is like a thick kind of purple. You're just like, uh, I'm sorry, what is this? It's supposed to distract you. It's supposed to deter you. It's supposed to make you not want to eat him. Because look at this big little squish squish, and this is actually, oh, it's actually kind of true to size. Probably could fit in my hand like that, and some of them get big too, like little chonky ones. Yeah, so cute. Um, but again, if he was unhappy and says, don't eat me, I have no teeth, I have no predator, I mean, I have no claws, I can't. I can't, I don't have a shell. Okay, so what he does is he inks. So if you have a shell, like a little clam, you're gonna clam up and protect yourself from predators. If you don't, say you're like one of these little guys, you're going to ink all over the place and hope that that predator does not like its food covered in ink. All right, moving to the next class. This is the class gastropoda. And this is kind of a big one. There's a lot in gastropoda and they look very different. So. We have the first order, which up is nudibranchia. Okay, so remember, if I tell you about an order and we kind of talk about it for a while, it might be we're going to be focusing on classes, but some of these orders, not the super orders or the suborders or the super classes or anything like that, but the big ones like, you know, nudibranchia, you will have to know. So I'm sorry, but yes, you will have to know this. So the nudibranchs come in lots of different ways. These guys are kind of like sea slugs. They're not because they're not in the sack of Lhasa. Right? These are nudibranchia. So these are nudibranchs. Okay? These guys come in a variety of different shapes. This guy is a pelagic nudibranch. This is a blue dragon. Super cool. Um, these guys are super bright and colorful and they have these like amazing little kind of feathery things coming off their back. And essentially this is all a warning. So it says, hey, I am bright and I am colorful and I am poisonous. Right? Not all of them are actually poisonous, but this is known as warning coloration. Remember we learned about that? So this is warning coloration. This guy's floating around in the middle of the ocean. There's not a lot out there to eat him. These two are like, hey, I have no protections except the fact that I am nasty to eat. So don't eat me because you're going to get sick. So that's hence these bright colors, letting them know, hey, I'm here and I'm dangerous. Oh, they're so cool. Um, yeah, new to break, yeah. So again, a lot of these guys, I might just ask you like one simple thing. What makes this guy different? And you'd say he has no shell, but he is poisonous. Okay, that's something I want you to remember about the nudibranchs. And remember, the nudibranchs look different than the sea slugs and the sea hares. So the nudibranchs usually have some kind of feathery plumage, and it's not feathers, obviously, but it's kind of coming off like this. So that's easy, easily recognizable. Ah, the subclass prosobranchia. All right. I'm not going to ask you about the subclass Prosobranchia, but I might ask you about these different orders. Order Archaeogastropoda, Neogastropoda, and Mesogastropoda. So these are actually kind of easy and therefore, I know, probably wouldn't ask you if it's an order or not, but I might, I don't know, we're going to talk about it, so I have to, I have to bring it up. Anyway, so in the subclo subclass Prosobranchia, this is where we're going to have that torsion, that twisting. So as soon as you see these guys, the Prosobranchias, you're like, yep, yeah, twisting. Okay, so not all gastropods are twisted, but these are all the twisted gastropods. Okay, so their visceral mass has gone undergone torsion. Again, that's the twisting part. Um, they have a shell, and they have that radula, that rasping tongue. This top guy right here. Okay. Now, not all of them have the radula, because not all of them need it. And some of them are actually modified into little drills, which is kind of crazy. Because um, you have predatory snails, and you're like, snails can't be predatory. Snails can be predatory. Some of them will try to kill you. Not you, obviously, but other organisms. All right, so the order Archaeogastropoda, or the old gastropods, these are going to be your abalone. Okay, they don't really look like the rest of them. Yes, they have twisting. They don't have a lot of twisting. It's kind of just like mild twisting. All right, you can see right here, this mild twisting right here. They also have a series of small holes that usually go along their shells. Now, this is important because they only have the one shell, so they're crawling around the bottom like this. Now, coming out the bottom area of them right here are going to be their little tentacles. And essentially what they're doing is they're feeling around and they're like looking for food. And these guys love algae. So these guys are looking for dead pieces of algae. In fact, if you ever come across an abalone, I don't know why you would, but if you did, you're maybe scuba diving, feed it a piece of abalone, or feed it a piece of algae, not abalone. Don't make it a, a cannibal. Feed it a piece of algae and it will love you. It like lifts up and it grabs it and like slowly sucks it in. It's very cool. 
Uh, the Neogastropoda, these are the new snails. Think of pretty much any snail that you can think of and that's probably gonna fall under the new snails, the Neogastropoda. And then we have the Mesogastropoda, kind of in between the old ones and the new ones, we have the Meso, the middle ones, the middle snails. And that's what you can see right here. Classic torsion, classic twisting. In this case, we have a pelagic snail. And you're like, snails can't be pelagic? Yes, they can. Fun fact, this guy creates a little bubble net, okay, that he's basically going, producing these little bubbles that he then holds onto. So his shell essentially floats upside down on the top level of the water like this, surrounded by bubbles. Super cool, pelagic snails, who knew? Um, this is a heteropod, this guy, it's always looked like Snoopy to me. He's got these like weird little eyes and it's like big schnoz coming out here, that big schnoz right there. There's the heteropods and the pteropods. I'm not gonna make you guys guess the difference between the two, but you know, if I show you that maybe for extra credit, you know it's a heteropod, I don't know. <gasps> Okay, the next one is hilarious. I have to show you this one. This is an A placophora. So we're gonna be learning about polyplacophoras, the many plates. We're gonna be learning about monoplacophoras, the one plate, and we're gonna be learning about the A placophoras, the no plates. Yeah, this is what it looks like. I'm not joking. It's about this long. It's about that big around. And it squirts out of this little hole right here when disturbed. I'm not joking. This guy is technically a mollusk, so he buries himself in the sand. So we were up in Bodega Bay one time, very famous estuary where these guys live, and we were doing core samples, and so we're boring holes, like big old holes like this, and we're, you know, pushing it down into the mud, and then we're pulling up these samples, and the I think the first one I did, I pulled it up, and out comes this guy flopping around at me and just lands on the floor in front of me, and my jaw hit the floor, and I just started dying laughing. Because I'm not, I don't have to tell you what it looks like. It, and it looks even more like this in person. I'm not sure. <laughs> so whoever created this guy, be, believe whatever you want to believe, that's hilarious. That's, that's absolutely hilarious. Um, just because I didn't want anyone to think that I'm showing you inappropriate pictures, I included a diagram of what they look like. You do not need to know any of this. I'm just showing it to you because this guy's hilarious. And I'm sorry, but that just cracked me up. Okay, moving on. Uh, let's talk about the monoplacophore is the one plate. So that was the aplacophore, the no plates. This is the monoplacophore, the one plate. These are the limpets, okay? So these are your tiny, tiny little limpets. Essentially, they look like little rocks, look like little tiny rocks, little tiny volcanoes that just crawl along the bottom. Definitely using the rasping tongue. There, these guys are eating the macro, mi sorry, microalgae that is found on the rocks in, say, the intertidal zone. And if I had had a chance to take you to the intertidal zone, we would have seen this. But if you ever want to go, guys, just look for the tiny little bumps on the bigger rocks. Limpets. Now these guys, you can see the variety of them right here. These guys are all probably about the size of a dime, maybe the size of a quarter. They don't get very big. And if you were to pop them off the rock and look underneath them, what you're going to see is this big old fleshy foot right here. This big fleshy foot is really handy in sucking down to the bottom of the rocks. So if you're sitting there and you're trying to pry him up, you're not going to be able to, okay? This is their defense mechanism. If I stick down to the rocks and hold on with my foot, nobody can pry me up and eat my soft squishies, right? So they can't get in you on the shell right here. So now you are free to crawl along and lick at all the rocks that you want to without fear of being eaten. Win-win. Um, what else? You can see his little two little antenna right here. This is his little mouth. Again, so he's just going along with sucking on the rocks. I'm not joking. Look at what videos of it. In fact, I might post a video a bit for the, you guys. This is crazy. Uh, okay, what else? Blah, 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 blah. I just keep talking. Um, ah, polyplacophora. That's where we're going. Polyplacophora are the many plates. So monoplacophora, the one plate. These are the polyplacophora, the many plates. In this case, they have eight. You can count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and eight. If you ever see eight plates, that is a chitin. Now, I did pronounce the CH because that's how you pronounce it. It's not chitin, it's chitin. So that's literally all I need you guys to know. These guys also have a radula. They also live in the intertidal zone. Some of them get a little bit bigger than the limpets, and they have eight plates. I know. So many characteristics. It's actually pretty easy, guys. I told you. We'll blow through these. Super easy. Oh my god, we are getting to my favorite of the class, class cephalopoda. So these are the head foots. So gastropoda means stomach foot. I didn't mention that earlier, but it means stomach foot. These guys are the ones crawling around on their stomachs, right? Like the limpets and the chitons we just learned about. 
These guys are the cephalopoda. Cephala means head. These are the head foots. So this actually has their mantle kind of modified into a head. We have a defined head, distinct head region now. Um, oh, and their foot, they're not crawling along in the bottom. They're actually modified their foot into tentacles. Okay, so they're not walking. Most of them are not walking along their feet, right? We're going to see one that is actually it's pretty cool. But they are actually using their, um, their siphon. So um, um, except for, sorry, excuse me, except for that one who is walking, a lot of them get by with the siphon. So this is known as a jet propulsion system. Essentially what they do with that siphon is they're sucking in water and they're squirting it out. So um, I don't even know how to, 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 right? That's kind of how they, they do it. If you guys have ever seen any kind of video on the, it's the same kind of thing. Again, they're just kind of almost like the, the you know, the uh, cnidarians that we talked about, the jellies, these guys, except they're shooting water this time. So it's poof, 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 with the shooting of the water out of their siphon. Um, these guys have amazing eyes. Okay. Amazing eyes. This is the first time that we're actually seeing a really well-developed eye. Okay. So some of the sea slugs that we say, yes, they have the little eyes, but not like these guys. These guys have um, an amazing eye, almost as good as I are, if not better. It's kind of crazy. Um, and they also have really big brains. So we're especially, especially things like octopus. Oh my God. They're so intelligent. I'm going to show you guys videos of it. It's going to be super cool. Um, but they really, they do have this will to find brain. So this is where we kind of get a little bit different than say like the gastropods. Okay. You, you know, you saw a snail, uh, not too complicated or, um, the bivalvia, right? It's a, it's a clam, it's, you know, it's not that not that exciting. Once you get to the cephalopods, it's actually where you're getting, you're getting activity, you're getting predation, you're getting problem solving, you're getting complex mating, you're getting a lot of these things. So the cephalopods really almost should be in their own phylum, but they're so related to mollusca in so many different ways they can't be. But they're really like the, the best of the best mollusca. So like imagine like the smartest, most accomplished mollusca, that would be the cephalopods for sure. And let's learn why. Um, before we do, let's actually finish talking about some of the characteristics that they all share before we get into the nitty gritty of it. Um, they do have the radula, which is now modified into the beak. Okay. So this is where we actually have the beak and we're going to see some of these. It is a straight up beak. Like if you were to pull it out and again, we would have done this one in, during our squid dissection, but it looks like a bird's beak. It's black. It's hard. It's, it's a beak. And it's again, used for the ripping and the shredding of meat because these guys are definitely predators. Um, their salivary glands sometimes have toxins. So you do not want to get bit by some of these octopus, some of these squid, like the blue ring octopus, which can actually cause death and it's really tiny. Um, what else? They have sensitive chemoreception. So when the tentacles are actually say touching you, really what they're doing is every single one of those is tasting you. So they have these suckers and the suckers have these like chemoreceptors and they can literally identify people based on the taste of their skin. So it's kind of like a dog scent. It's a, it's an octopus's touch. It's nuts. Um, they do have giant nerve fibers. So this is again, where we're getting that more complicated brain, like these neurons, we're actually getting these nerve nets that are now getting more complicated into these nerve fibers. Um, so they do, they have, they're very, you know, they can feel, they can definitely feel and sense way more than say some of these other guys. Um, what else? They have an ink sac. Okay. Just like the, a ple Oh, the sea hair we learned about was a plesia, a plesia. So if you hear, hear, me, hear me say plesia, that's the one we have of our coast, the California sea hair, a plesia. So these guys do have the ink sac just like a plesia. And this is again, chemical defenses. Most of these guys do not have shells internal or for sure external. And therefore they have no way of defending themselves against predator. That beak's not really going to cut it. Although we are going to talk about that. Um, all right, so they have an ink set, a sack again to ward off predators. Oh, what's so cool that nobody else has these guys. Chromatophores, okay? Chromatophores are color and texture changing pigments in the skin. They can literally, okay? So you're now soft and smooth, but now you're literally like spiky and bumpy and dark. That's what chromatophores are. They change the color of your skin. It's the most amazing thing because some of these guys can do it to match their surroundings but they can do it in complete darkness. So you're like, how can you even see the surroundings, let alone match it? 
it's we still are totally in awe about these chromatophores and are still studying them every single day so it's, it's really pretty cool stuff um what else oh they are the largest out of the any invertebrates shocker clams don't get that big actually some of them do in thailand i saw some honking clams but nothing compared to these guys because they have things like the giant squid that is like 30 feet long is it 28 30 feet long something like that it's huge just imagine several stories of squid. So this is like what Jules Verne used to talk about when, oh, the sea monsters and squids attacking the boats. Well, guess what? He wasn't that far off because they are massive. And there are peop people, there are things who eat them like sperm whales. Sperm whales eat giant squid. And you're like, wait, there's that many giant squid out there that sperm whales are eating them on a regular basis? You bet. They absolutely 100% are. In fact, they're found in the depths of the ocean. And that's where sperm whales the deepest diving animal in the world dives all the way down to to go get so if you've ever seen a sperm whale and it has like cuts and scrapes near its mouth on its big you know you know the sperm whale one they're they're like the ah. See, it's like the moby dick one right or the pinocchio one that guy right it's a terrible drawing but he's got the big melon that huge melon is used to go ping Ping! Giant squid, dive, dive, dive! He gets it, but then when he comes up, he's got epic battle scars. Because guess what? That giant squid was biting him with his beak, right? He's like, get off me, get off me! So you'll actually see scars all over the face of these um, uh, humpback whales, not humpback whales, sperm whales. Um, because they, got, they go dive down and to hunt for these giant squid. Right? How cool is that? I know. Cephalopods, man. It's just my favorite. Moving on. Let's talk about the subclass Nautiloidea. Okay? These are the Nautiluses. If you guys have never seen a Nautilus, they're actually pretty freaky looking. They live inside this big shell right here, so they do have an external shell. Now, when it comes to other cephalopods, you can or cannot have a shell. These guys have a shell. Okay? This is what the inside of their shell looks like. So what you can see are these are actually little septa. These are little chambers that are separating each one of these. So as it grows, it kind of lays down another little chamber right here. And they're all connected via this little hole right there. And so they're basically, their main body sits right here, going a little bit farther back, but their tentacles are going to kind of sit right here. This is the eye coming out here. What you can't see is the siphon. And these guys are gonna, and again, siphon and blow that water outwards so they can travel almost in a backwards direction. Now looking inside the Nautilus, and again, this is just for reference purposes here. These are our septa right here, these little separations. Um, the siphuncal is the tube, that, that opening that goes all the way down that I showed you. Each of these are the, the little chambers that I talked about. Now the main part of his body is gonna be sitting right here. And you've got your stomach, your cecum, your intestines, all your digestive organs. You want those tucked in, you want those protected. You don't want those floating around out here that could get damaged. You want them inside the shell here, nice and protected right in here. Um, same thing with your kidney, your heart, all that kind of stuff is going to be found on the inside of the shell. Um, you do want your gills somewhat close to the opening here because that's, again, what's going to give you that oxygen circulation. So you're going to be able to pull in that oxygen you need, release out that CO2. Um, what is we have here? We've got the jaw, we've got the tongue, the mouth, the hood. Again, we don't really need to go into all of these, but I just kind of want to show you guys how these are built and so that, how they kind of relate to this little guy right here. Because you're looking at that and you're like, I don't know, it just looks like a shell with a weird tentacle face sticking out with just one eye yeah it's my Nautilus impression right there well that is kind of what like the look they look like so now you can see what they look like on the inside all right moving to the subclass coleoida these are your squids okay so we're i don't want to talk to they're not just your squids they're pretty much everything afterwards. I don't want to confuse you too much because I don't want to give you too much taxonomy. So let's focus on the order. So don't worry so much about the subclass. Let's just focus on the order. So we're focusing on the classes and we're focusing on the orders, the big stuff. All right, so to break down the whole group, they all have an internal shell or no shell, shocker, and they all have one pair of gills. It doesn't really define it, you know? So we need to define it a little bit more. Let's break it down into each one of these different orders. So we have the order Sepoidea. These are the cuttlefish right? Different than the Nautilus. The cuttlefish is different. Um, they do have a shell with septa, right? Remember those little separations that we learned about? And sometimes they're greatly reduced or even lost. Um, 
The body is mostly short and broad and sack like. We're going to see that in just a second. The toothoidia, these are the squids, and there's two different types. We're not going to go into the two different types of squids. We're just going to learn about squids as a whole. They do have a shell. It is internal, and it is known as a pen. If we were doing the dissection, we would have actually pulled this pen out, but if you want to Google it, it literally kind of looks like almost one of those old school um, like feather pens that you would like, dip your ink into, and that's what people exactly did. They would kill the squid, pull out its pen, dip it in its own ink, and then write your name. In fact, I used to encourage that in my lab class, but the squid's already dead. Most of the time, the ink was all dried up, so it didn't actually work most of the time, but you can, hence it's called a pen. Um, their body is elongated with the tentacles hanging downwards. We have the Vampire Morpha. These are super cool. They're squids, but they're specific squids. These are vampire squids. These guys are deep water. These guys are bright red. These guys are badass. They got spikes instead of suckers. Super cool. And then finally, we have the order Octopoda, my favorite of the orders because octopuses are just so freaking cool. Uh, and these are going to be your octopuses and your paper nautilus. What? We have nautiluses and paper nautiluses? Yes, we do. Keep that in mind. Starting with the super ordered Decapoda, and we're going to see another Decapoda. That might be, I don't know, an extra credit question. Which, what are the two Decapods? Decapoda, what's going to come in? Oh, I'm not going to spoil it. Oh, I almost did. Uh, anyway, super ordered Saboidia. These are the ones you actually need to know. Sorry. Just super ordered Decapoda. Order Saboidia. That's what you need to know. Just the order. Um, these are your cuttlefish. And this is what the cuttlefish typically look like. Broad, flattened body right here. Nice little wavy, almost skirt. Again, this is just his mantle that's been modified or his foot that's been modified, essentially. Eyes, really well-developed eyes. Um, tentacles hanging down here. Siphon underneath, which... I'm going to show you guys a video, and actually a really funny video, one of my favorite videos ever, um, that's going to kind of give you guys like a, like a fun insight into, um, into the cuttlefish. So hopefully you guys watch it and love it as much as I do. Uh, these guys do have a shell with greatly reduced septa, and that's because their shell essentially is known as a cuddled bone. It's, it's called a bone because it doesn't really look much like a shell. It's definitely internal. It helps with buoyancy, um, and people use them for birds. You know, it's funny, if you've ever had a cuddle bone and your bird, like, scrapes its beak, it's the bone of a cuttlefish, uh, hence cuddle bone, so that's pretty cool, and we're going to see that in the video as well. Um, so, yeah, cuddle bone. Uh, and we already talked about their body. This is, again, we have their big mantle right here. This mantle has been modified into these fins. Again, that fin kind of waves a little bit, like a skirt almost, helping him move along and maneuver. Two big large eyes, one large siphon on the bottom. It's really its, it's ventral side. Tentacles hanging down here, surrounding its mouth. The mouth is a beak for the grabbing and the shredding. Um, we have eight arms. Um, and two tentacles. So yes, we do vary in the number of tentacles and arms and they're not the same thing. So we have eight tentacles and two arms. Um, and I, sorry, what did I say? Eight arms and two tentacles. That's what it is. Eight arms, two tentacles. Okay. Ah, let's get to the cuttlefish video. You're going to love it. Just my absolute favorites. Hopefully you like that guy. All right. So how do these guys all relate? Well, we believe that there was some ancestral mollusca that, again, diverged evolutionarily wise. And now we get the clams and now we get the squids and now we get the octopuses and now we get the snails. But they all still have these general characteristics that make them the same phylum. So even though the clams look very different than the octopus, they are still very closely related. And this is why, you know, this is what we believe to be some kind of ancestor, either modified into a closed up more shell or we've flattened out the shell and we've actually got the, the squid or the octopus. So, you know, similar, similar structures from some common ancestor that we're not 100% sure of what it was, but we definitely know that it existed at some point. With that, that's all I have for you guys. You survived another one of my lectures. Thank you so very much. Um, this isn't the actual octopus, but an uh, octopus named Otto was basically at an aquarium, and one day he was so sick of this one light that was blinding him. And actually, if you go to a lot of aquariums, they say no flash photography, no bright lights, no you know flashlights, anything like that, because they're they have really good eyes. They're really sensitive, and they're for like, hey, get away from me, dude. 
And so he was really pissed off about this little light. So it actually caused a blackout and an electrical shortage because he, with his siphon, shot a jet of water across the room, short circuiting the light just to get it off um, because he just, you know, he was done with it. He's also been seen rearranging his tank. He's also been seen juggling snails <laughs> and little hermit crabs and stuff like that. So Otto, my man, super cool guy. Um, I will leave you with one last story. Uh, my ex-boyfriend and I, we used to work at the California Science Center and I was a volunteer diver and he used to train this octopus and this octopus was only supposed to live for three or four years and I think he was like five or six at the time like, because my ex-boyfriend used to give him all sorts of different enrichment and so they are so smart they need this enrichment what he was doing what Otto was doing is is mental enrichment he's keeping himself busy and occupied and keeping his brain fresh by problem solving and so giving them puzzles giving them little stuff to play with and things to open and kind of look at really does like really super enrich your life and I remember the last day he left and he quit I think the octopus died like two two weeks later because I said he died of a broken heart because it missed him because remember the chemo receptors in the skin I know anyway didn't mean to leave you on a sad note octopuses are so cool and it is octopuses not octopi thank you so much for joining me for another lecture you guys have a wonderful week and um, I will see you guys very shortly